We're live, Madam Chair. Thanks. And Brendan hasn't come on? Not yet. All right. Well, we're going to get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our, our November uh, GIC meeting. Uh, right around the time of Thanksgiving. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have this long serving uh, position here at the GIC as chair of a terrific commission. So uh, as first order of business, let me read uh, who's on our, our, our live stream here and welcome our, all of our YouTube listeners. So as I said, I'm Valerie Sullivan, I'm chair we're joined by Bobby Kaplan, who's our vice chair. We're joined by Rebecca Butler, designee for Division of Insurance, uh, Commissioner Adam Chapdelaine, Commissioner Toby Choate, Commissioner Christy Clenard, Commissioner Joe Gentile, Commissioner Eileen McEnany, Commissioner Melissa Murphy Rodriguez, Commissioner Anna Seneco, Commissioner Tim Sullivan, uh, and Commissioner Tamara Davis, as well as uh, Cassandra Roeder, uh, designee for uh, at ANF. Uh, so welcome everyone. And if I missed anyone of our commissioners, uh, I do see Liz Shabbat's on as well, Commissioner Shabbat's on. So we've got a great group today. And our first order of business is our one and only vote. So at this time, I will take a motion to approve our minutes from our October 21st meeting. So moved. So that was Bobby Kaplan, thank you. Seconded by Commissioner Kleinard. Thank you. So as order of business, I'm going to ask Andrew, our general counsel to take roll call. And Andrew, I am a yay. Uh, so you might need to take yourself off mute. Andrew. Thank you for the reminder. Yes. And thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Kaplan. Yay. Uh, Designee Roder. Olive Stein. Okay. Uh, Designee Butler. Yay. Uh, Commissioner Shabbat. Commissioner Shabbat. It doesn't look like Commissioner Shabbat is connected to audio. So I'll okay, get in touch. Okay, we'll come back. Commissioner Chapdelaine. Aye. Commissioner Choate. Yes. Commissioner Clonard. Aye. Commissioner Davis. Aye. Commissioner Gentile. Yes. Commissioner McEnany. Aye. Commissioner Murphy Rodriguez. Yes. Commissioner Sinenko. Yay. And Commissioner Tim Sullivan. Yes. Okay. Has Commissioner Chabot obtained audio? Not yet. Um, the motion passes nonetheless uh, with one abstention and uh, with two abstentions. So thank you, Andrew. So we have a very exciting uh, content uh, prepared for this meeting. I'm going to pass it over to our executive director, Matt Vino, and he will take us through today's meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the commission and those uh, from the public who are following along with our meeting. Uh, we have, uh, as our chair noted, a um, uh, a, kind of a, a short but rich agenda today, um, in addition to a quick preview, a review of our director's report. Um, we will have um, staff from our uh, vendor relations area give an um, overview of um, our takeaways from our uh, numerous meetings with our vendors over the course of uh, mostly the month of kind of late September through October, um, about the current state of their performance and challenges. And then we will start kind of our uh, first discussion, really starting to get into our um, health benefit procurement strategy 
um, which will have us very busy over the coming uh, probably 13 months, I guess. Um, so we look forward to doing um, to doing that for you here today. Next slide. Great. So um, for our executive director's report, per usual, we have provided uh, that report in writing to commissioners ahead of time. I'm happy to take any questions or comments on uh, items in that uh, executive director's report, but I will highlight a few items. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give a little shout out to our communications manager, uh, Leslie Montero, for the refresh of the look and feel of our meeting deck. Um, so I hope you uh, enjoy the, um, the new look of this. Um, I also wanna highlight um, uh, that we have uh, three positions at the GIC that we are currently filling for. Um, we are happy uh, to share information about those and encourage um, our commissioners to share those uh, with their networks. We're always looking for um, uh, for top level talent to join the team here. And if you can help us um, in any way, that would be terrific. Uh, and then I will note that uh, things are, are very busy in the legislature as it relates to healthcare. Um, related to that, uh, a little bit later today, uh, I and some of my colleagues at the GIC will be doing a um, briefing for members of the legislature and staff this is uh, part of our ongoing engagement with the legislature. We've met with just about all members of leadership um, and relevant committee chairs and staff um, and the uh, co-chairs of healthcare financing, uh, as Senator Friedman and Representative um, Lawn uh, have gracious, graciously agreed to host a briefing that we will hold uh, later today. Um, there is also, as I mentioned, a good deal of action on healthcare issues. Um, we have the Senate who has released a bill related to mental health and mental health access with uh, several provisions that do relate to the GIC, uh, which we have been evaluating and providing feedback on. Uh, and the, um, the House uh, advanced a bill uh, yesterday uh, that relates to market oversight of uh, mergers and transactions and other changes in the marketplace um, and the oversight of the Health Policy Commission. So there's a lot going on in the legislature um, that we will be watching very closely. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or comments on the director's report. I just had one question uh, and maybe it's more of a comment and to bring in both Melissa and Adam. Just wanted to uh, hear a little bit about the municipalities and uh, any new ones that are interested in joining or conversations with those that are interested in joining. Uh, you know, there's so many rich benefits and uh, you know, I'm such a big fan of the benefits we provide at the GIC, you know, always looking for new, new municipalities. And before they weigh in, I'll just remind commissioners that December 1 is our deadline to be notified. So we'll be providing an update on that in our next meeting, but happy to hear what uh, our municipal commissioners may be hearing. Um, on my end, I'm not hearing too much chatter. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of all still in the throes of COVID and COVID rehab. Um, I think it sounds like most communities are gonna, who are in are gonna probably stay in at this point from what I'm hearing just chatter wise. Um, and we're all kind of looking towards next year's procurement um, before we make any real decisions. Thank you. So I would only add that um, I've, I've not heard of anybody deciding to leave, not that I, not that I would absolutely hear. Uh, and recently I was sitting with a working group from uh, Belmont, which is a neighbor of Arlington who are looking at various ways they might be able to save money for the town. And they made plan design changes back when municipal health insurance reform passed in 2012, but chose at that time not to enter the GIC. I shared with them the great benefits Arlington has experienced from a cost and 
sort of service perspective from the JC, and they were very intrigued by that. So I don't know exactly what they might pursue, but um, I, I have been, when when able, trying to act as an advocate for communities to consider the GIC as an option for their for their health insurance for their employees. Oh, that's terrific! Thank you, Adam. And if anyone from uh, from our team uh, wants to follow up with Belmont, it sounds like uh, might have some interest. So thanks. All right, back to you, Matt. Uh, Commissioner Kleinert has her hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Matt. I just have a quick question about the letter that you forwarded in the materials about the expansion. I think it was in Westboro. And I'm just curious, is that gaining any traction? Are people talking about that? It was really interesting and I appreciate you forwarding it to us. Yeah, thank you for that inquiry. It's um, actually, there is, um, a great deal of discussion about that topic. So the article for those who um, are listening from the public uh, related to uh, Mass General Brigham's uh, proposed expansion that is under review at the Department of Public Health for a determination of need. It's an, uh, an expansion of their uh, downtown inpatient uh, facilities and a significant outpatient expansion to a number of communities in the suburbs. Um, I would say, you know, the, one additional update was just this morning, I read an article in Boston Business Journal that the Attorney General has weighed in with the Health Policy Commission, who also has a role here expressing some strong concerns about the impact of that um, expansion on the health and the health of the healthcare marketplace, particularly the delivery system. Um, that number one, I'd say number two, yesterday was the Health Policy Commission cost trends hearing. And this issue was discussed at significant length. So I would direct commissioners um, who wanna uh, continue to follow along on this topic, um, uh, to, 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 to read that article in the, in the business journal, perhaps read the AG's report. Uh, we are following this very closely. I would say from my perspective, I share the concerns that, that many others have shared, in, including the attorney general, that this has a potentially profound inflationary impact um, for payers like the Group Insurance Commission. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. But I will, the one other thing I will say is as you've heard, as the commission has heard me um, and my team over the last year talking about our primary concerns in the area of cost drivers, um, rising provider prices continues to be at the top of the list. Um, we heard that again, um, delivered very strongly by the Health Policy Commission based on their analysis. And this expansion has um, the possibility of further exacerbating um, that challenge. So we are watching that very closely. All right, thanks, Matt. I don't see any other questions, so uh, you may continue. Great. Um, On to our calendar. As you can see, we're coming to the end of calendar 2021. I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but you can see um, where we uh, where we are today. And then at our next meeting, in addition to our municipal update, we will start the process of rate development for fiscal year 2023 with a presentation from Vince Kane from Willis Towers Watson. Next slide, please. So again, I went through this slide in detail at our October meeting, so I won't go through it um, in detail here again, since there haven't been really any substantive changes. I will just note, re-emphasize the asterisk at the bottom here as we may need to adjust items um, as we head into a very busy uh, first quarter of the calendar year. 
In particular, uh, the strategy update here that's noted for the February 10th meeting um, may shift to another meeting, either forward or backward, uh, depending on the trajectory of um, our work. Um, and I'll have more to say about the procurement process um, uh, during the strategy update a little bit um, later on in the meeting. Happy to take any questions on the calendar. Um, Matt, Toby Choate, I have my hand up. Um, this may not be a popular topic for all, but do you have any sense of when we'll be able to start meeting face-to-face uh, -face again? I don't have uh, any additional guidance, I guess, at this point about when that will happen. Um, I would say that the chair and I continue to be in communication about um, when that makes uh, the most logical sense. We do continue to monitor as uh, public health officials do the course of the pandemic. I, I myself am eager to um, start meeting again in person, at least in some form. Um, uh, I, I think it is, um, it is my intent to try to find opportunities for us to continue to have remote participation. Of course, we will have to make that decision with you um, before we proceed down that road. So not a lot of specifics at this point, Toby, but um, we will start to reintroduce that at, this, at the soonest possible moment. I know other commissioners have expressed a desire to reintroduce that as soon as we can. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think you can keep going, Matt. All right, at this point, I will turn it over to um, over to uh, Janine Dewar, Manager of Health and Pharmacy Benefits, and Cameron McBean, Manager of Health and Ancillary Benefits. I believe Cameron is gonna um, walk us through the findings of um, our stewardship meetings um, with some support from Janine. So hand it over to Cameron. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you. Yes, in the interest of time, um, I'll be uh, handling the presentation. If there's any questions that I can't handle, Janine's standing by. Um, we did conduct our annual stewardship meetings with our uh, medical and pharmacy benefit carriers um, throughout October and into early September. Um, because the dental and vision and life and LTD contracts were all renewed, um, we decided not to conduct those meetings this fall. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So starting off with pharmacy, uh, we did not see as much impact uh, from COVID. Uh, unfortunately, the increases in spend continued similarly to what we experienced last year. Once again, specialty pharmacy is the key driver uh, when it comes to the increase we see in our pharmacy spend, um, specialty medications, especially for the inflammatory and uh, other conditions, those medications like Humira, um, and then especially in the retiree population in our EGWIP plan, um, the very expensive oncology medications are a, another significant cost driver. Any questions on pharmacy before we continue? Okay, next slide, please. Um, one interesting note we wanted to call out is this is something we first saw in last year's review of the, the plan's performance and claim activity. Um, we've actually continued to see a decrease in emergency room utilization, as well as a concurrent increase in urgent care. So whether by you know choice, happenstance, or design, we are actually seeing a lot of our membership transition away from that high dollar emergency room utilization to the more uh, affordable and practical urgent care sites. So that's something that uh, gives us a little bit of hope that, you know, even as things have opened back up, those trends have uh, continued. 
We wanted to call out some of the, the top chronic conditions that our membership continues to experience. You know, as you can see, uh, diabetes, mood disorders, such as anxiety and depression, uh, breast cancer and inflammatory conditions are all uh, significant factors amongst our population. Um, we continue to press our uh, health insurance carrier partners on uh, matters of health equity, and they are working in good faith to improve our data collection uh, efforts on that front, uh, as well as taking additional action on their own to uh, better serve our population. Next slide, please. So in terms of the overall impact uh, of this last year across, across the plans. The real story is the deferred care that we experienced in the you know initial days of the lockdown and the, those first six to 12 months of the pandemic. So as a result of that, we've seen an increase in risk scores, which we can confidently assume are, are uh, derived from uh, deferred screenings. So someone with a serious condition, it may have been caught later, um, as well as the return of more elective procedures that are you know, continuing to catch up in, in, the, in the pipeline uh, amongst our membership. So while we saw a year over year uh, increase overall of 14.1% in our PMPM, that's per member per month spend. Um, we also need to keep in mind that the prior year was depressed because of the discontinuation of those elective surge or of those elective procedures. So looking at it on a two year average, going back to uh, fiscal year 19, which was for lack of a better term a more normal year, the uh, trend is a little bit lower. But again, we're seeing the result of increases in both cost and utilization that are uh, driving these uh, numbers. Any questions? Commissioner Seneco. Thanks. Thanks for this great overview. Um, I was curious, as you see the, the bounce back, you know, after the initial lockdown and, and sort of this high, and does it look like, um, does it look like it was like an equivalent compensation, right? Like it was a low, the, whatever the dip was, was made up in equal volume afterwards or, or not quite yet or, or even more? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it a one-to-one -one correlation, although it's you know, it, there definitely is a correlation. Um, you know, one of the one of the other key drivers is, you know, the the care that come, you know, the the treatments and procedures that have come back seem on average to be costing more as well. So it's it's not just the return of utilization. It is, you know, we are continuing to see incre increased costs for procedures now, you know, whether or not that is related to, you know, the conditions themselves being more acute and severe at this point is a little bit harder to determine, you know, based on the higher level reviews that, that we've done to date. Uh, Commissioner McEnany. Uh, thanks. So my question somewhat follows um, Commissioner, the, the former Commissioner, in that at the health cost trend hearing yesterday, there was a talk about a trend of increased severity that, that patients were essentially being um, written up for lack of a better word. So, so the severity was on the rise or across the board, which I, I do think is worth further exploring. So wondering if eventually we'll, we'll be able to ascertain if that's going on with the group insurance commission um, coverage, but also more importantly, kind of what we can do to prevent that, right? Like we don't want them to be increased unnecessarily. So. Yeah, if I can speak to that just briefly, thank you for that excellent question, I, uh, Commissioner McEnany. It's, um, this is definitely an area that we are and will continue to dig into. Um, 
we um, we need to sort through whether there is actual rising severity, which I suspect there is some of that, or whether the coding practices on the part of providers are evolving in a way um, that um, that that is inappropriate and really doesn't um, reflect a change in severity. So uh, as you noted, the Health Policy Commission's done some really excellent work there, uh, suggesting that a good, a sizable portion of the rising severity is simply uh, attributable to coding factors because we don't see, they don't see, and we certainly don't see in our very stable population, any significant shifts in demographics or, even membership shifts within plans, as we know, right? So if, if, if essentially the carriers have the same population that doesn't change a whole lot from year to year, disease prevalence is not changing dramatically, I think perhaps with the exception of COVID-19, and our demographic shifts aren't changing, then it really does beg the question, um, is there increased severity? So we will, we will be looking um, into that in great detail. Um, looks like we've got another uh, question. Uh, Commissioner Kleiner. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Chris. Hi there. I just wanted to follow up on what you said, Matt. I think just anecdotally, some of the things, and again, this is very anecdotally, with me, my family, and my friends is a, is almost like a, a psychological change that has happened with some providers when people come in that if they're not feeling well or they have certain symptoms that it almost feels, I've heard many stories of what the follow-up is from that being much more extensive than it seemed like it was pre-COVID. That there's almost a psychology I wonder if hasn't changed because of COVID to really be much more and maybe too aggressive sometimes when you go in for something that ends up being a cold, for example. Right, and, and look, I think we want to, the analysis we want to hear, we want, that we want to do here, we want to be really thoughtful, right? So we certainly don't want to discount um, any, um, severity that is legitimate that's happening um, and appropriately paying for those services for our members. But if there are revenue maximization strategies that are, that are being amplified on the provider side, um, that is an area where we are simply losing value. We're losing money. Um, so we will um, we'll have to sort through those very carefully. All good questions. Uh, any other questions from commissioners? Well, I just wanted to say, I think there's something though in between, you know, maximization strategies. And I guess that's what I, I inartfully said was that it's, that, that it's just more a psychological thing by some of the providers. Uh, but I don't know I don't know. I know you all will be thoughtful in determining it. I just wonder if it's something more intangible out there in the ether because of what we've all just gone through with COVID. That's really interesting. So um, um, uh, we have a, an engagement um, meeting scheduled for a little bit later this month or perhaps early December with uh, Mass Medical Society. And that'd be a, a really interesting question to pose to them. Okay. I believe Vice Chair Kaplan has a question. Yes, I, I don't know. It's maybe more of a comment, but I'm just curious. There was a, an article in the Globe today regarding the significant increase in opioid uh, deaths. And so that s uh, leads to my question regarding substance abuse. If, if this a lot of the increase or how much of the increase in cost is related to substance abuse, um, uh, you know, care, treatment, 
and as well as behavioral health, as opposed to the increases in, you know, just regular medical or deferred care. We did see increases across all of our plans in uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder uh, treatments um, and and claims expenditures. Um, A lot of that was driven by increased behavioral health telehealth utilization, um, but we also continued to see increases uh, amongst substance uh, use disorder treatments as well. Um, This is an ongoing focus uh, for the GIC and our carrier partners. It's a key component of uh, our upcoming procurement strategy, which Matt will be touching on shortly. Um, The the biggest challenge on that front is access. Um, There are just not enough providers available in many cases to adequately serve our membership. And that's, you know, not just a GIC specific problem that is uh, throughout the Commonwealth and nationwide, frankly. Yeah, and I will say thank you for that, Cameron. Thank you, Vice Chair, for that question. Um, As you may know, and um, the GIC covers uh, drugs for substance use disorder without cost sharing, which is a I think a kind of a market leading strategy in many respects. Um, And we will be as part of our uh, rate development, um, looking at those sorts of underlying trends and what they mean for us going forward. So that would be an excellent question to ask of Vince Kane at our December meeting. Good, all right. Uh, Floor is back to you guys, Cameron and... Commissioner Chap- Kaplan, did you have one final no, follow-up? No, sorry, I raised my okay. hand by mistake, sorry. All right, thank you very much, commissioners. All right, so on to our next uh, presentation. Is that Janine? No? Nope. Oh, this um, comes back to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that concludes the um, report on um, the stewardship meetings. Uh, so I just want to thank my um, my my team, Jim Rust, Janine Dewar, Cameron McBean, um, Margaret Anschutz, um, who have really been leading this work with Lauren Makashima on, on Margaret's team. These are a tremendous amount of work on our part and the carrier's part. So, um, but they really do give us Um, a a helpful preliminary view of where our current state and current challenges are with our carriers as we head into the next phase here, which is our rate development. So um, I feel like the the, the, uh, sequence here is always really helpful to us. I also wanna thank the folks at Willis Towers Watson, uh, extremely helpful and our carriers who put a lot of work into these presentations. So, thank everybody for making that a productive process. And here we'll shift gears a little bit and um, uh, start to discuss uh, our work on procurement strategy. So next slide, please. So um, before I kind of get into this slide, I do want to um, just address a little bit of the challenge that we're gonna face here. So we want, of course, to be as candid and transparent with our commission about these evolving strategy as we possibly can, and we commit to do that. Um, I also wanna make sure that when we bring uh, topics back to the commission, they are fully baked um, ideas and strategies. Um, So we're gonna do our best over the coming months to strike the right balance there. Um, By way of brief reminder, um, state procurement laws do require the GIC to contract, recontract uh, with our vendors every five years. And as you know, we are currently in the fourth year of our current five year cycle um, with our uh, current carriers uh, and PBMs. Um, So our coming annual enrollment uh, this coming spring will be the last procure the last annual enrollment for the current uh contracts and this will be coverage uh for fiscal year 23 
Um, the GIC has um, structured our contracts with our vendors as a, a three-year term with one-year optional renewals of the GIC, and we have uh, typically extended those um, those optional renewal years. But they do give us an opportunity to make some some tweaks along the way um, as we get further out from the procurement that produced them. So, and then here, just a reminder of our strategic priority areas, like. I don't think we can say that enough um, where we are focusing our attention. Next slide. So I thought it might be helpful to start with a quick refresher of our current offerings um, for active employees and dependents. The GIC offers 11 plans. This on the left side here through six different insurance companies, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts and Fallon each offer a broad network uh, PPO and narrow network HMOs. Um, Health New England and Always are our regional carriers um, that cover, H&E uh, uh, &E covers a good uh, swath of, of Western Mass, whereas Always, while they are um, cover a good portion of the state are not fully statewide. Uh, Unicare is somewhat unique in our portfolio as the state's indemnity plan. Um, and of course, Express Scripts um, is the PBM for our actives. Um, on the retiree side, the GIC offers Medicare plans to retirees through um, uh, the, the insurance companies that you see here, all six of them. And they uh, all offer a Medicare supplement plan and Tufts Health Plan also offers a Medicare Advantage plan and the prescription drug benefit administered through CVS Health. I've also included um, in the appendix of the deck, you'll see uh, enrollment by these different plans as it currently sits. Next slide. So it's a little bit of a busy slide. There's a lot on here, but it lays out the plan designs, including copays and deductibles that apply to each. There is some minor variations. So these features are not um, com a complete and accurate depiction, but in general shows the strategy that we've tried to take with these plans. As you can see on the health plan side, we have modestly lower cost sharing in some areas for our narrow and regional plans, which uh, tend to be less expensive. Um, and that's on the right uh, than we do for the national and broad plans uh, on the left. And you can see we tier copays for a variety of services, um, including primary care, specialist visit, and um, in some aspects of prescription drugs. And I think it's just a reminder for commissioners here that as many other employers do, the GIC does not have authority to vary the percentage of premium paid by employees in the Commonwealth. That is a plan feature uh, that is not within our control, rather a set in state statute and consistent across all of our plans. Any questions on this? Um, just want to make sure people understand kind of where we are today. Okay, proceed to the next slide. Um, so while we currently have six health insurance companies and vendors as vendors for our health plans, uh, as we have informed you over the past year, as is sometimes the case, uh, these private companies make business decisions that can affect our lineup. Fallon has decided they will no longer be offering coverage to GIC members at the end of our current fiscal year. So on June 30th, 2022 will be the um, last day of coverage uh, through uh, Fallon. Uh, furthermore, um, it does not appear likely that they will be a bidder through the next procurement, at least on the active plan side. Um, additionally, with the merger of Harvard Pilgrim and Tufts Health Plan into Point32, we expect Point32 to bid one combined offering through the next procurement. Um, as we've noted before, Point32 has committed to making no changes to their GIC offerings um, until FY24, so this will not uh, affect our members um, who will continue to have access to the full suite of both plans um, 
uh, plan designs through uh, the end of fiscal 23. So in essence, we're heading into our next procurement um, with two fewer carriers as incumbent vendors. And just want to emphasize, I hope it's clear, but I want to emphasize that these are not decisions made by the GIC, but rather are business decisions made by private companies um, with which we contract. Um, and that does have an impact um, on the um, lineup of incumbents going into the next procurement. Any question? I see a, a question from our vice chair. Yes, uh, Matt, I was just curious um, as I'm looking at this slide, um, if Point 32 Health will be offering a plan for retirees as well um, in, uh, in FY24. Do you have a sense of whether they will or not? Uh, it, I, I wanna be careful here not to speculate. Um, I would say in our current conversations with them, um, that has not arisen, um, but we still have a ways to go. I, I suspect that point 32, as with any carrier, will have to evaluate the RFR and see if they can meet the requirements of the RFR to continue. Um, but I don't, um, at this point, have um, any reason to believe that they would not. I don't want to really say more than that at this point. That's fine. No, it just it just sort of piqued my interest when I saw mm -hmm. offering for GIC active. So, um, all right. Thank you. So, uh, here's a kind of high level process overview of our procurement process using the framework that's been designed um, by the Commonwealth Operational Services Division. Those who are on the commission um, for the last procurement may recall um, uh, some presentations made by OSD about this process. And you'll see for each phase here, we've included GIC specific activities that we are conducting in these different buckets. Um, as you know, we are currently in the research and planning phase that informs the drafting of our RFR. And it's important to note here that while we are in the middle phase conducting the procurement, um, we are bound by strict confidentiality rules to preserve the integ integrity, fairness, and ultimately the um, uh, success of the process. Um, so as you have heard me say many times before, we are uh, committed to being as engaged and transparent as we can in the months that lead up to the release of the RFR. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit about the timing there in a moment. But once the RFR is released, you should um, not expect substantive updates um, from us about how the process is going as we review bids and develop our recommendation to you in the fall. Um, I will here note that um, we are exploring how much um, we how much we can do um, in the fall. Um, with the commission at our September and November meetings um, before the final votes. We want um, to be able to give our commissioners a sufficient time and bandwidth to evaluate our recommendation uh, before we proceed to a vote. Um, but I think as has been um, highlighted in, um, in past procurements that that presents real challenges because when we do that, we bring the commission into a confidential stage in the process, which really continues until our contract, um, our contracts with our vendors are executed. Um, so that may be an executive session, it may be um, other methods, but um, uh, what I can pledge to you is we're going to do as much as we can here to give you as much time and as much information that you need as commissioners to make an informed um, an informed vote. Questions about the process here? No, I don't see any, Matt. I want to. Um, oh, Valerie, Valerie, this is Tamara. Hi, Tamara. Uh, can you? Yeah, can you hear me? 
Um, so th the question I have, um, have we uh, considered um, the, the players that are going to engage with us? Um, I'm talking about uh, the current and, and, and new players in terms of providing services, players nationally that we might not have considered in the past um, in, in terms of po possibly providing um, innovative kind of services to us that we might not have considered because we've been very locally focused. Um, and, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about the pharmacy side. Um, I'm talking about the healthcare side in terms of the insurance. Um, so I was wondering if we, are we looking nationally to, uh, to potential bidders? And also, are we really analyzing the bidders and what we need and what we can get so that we don't have too much redundancy in terms of our offerings once, uh, once we determine you know, the scope uh, of the players, then determining you know, how many players should we have uh, in terms of providing these services where there is no redundancy, but yet we cover um, our, uh, our uh, member base and um, in thinking about efficiencies in terms of cost. So that's a lot, I know, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm just thought, thinking about strategically looking at this going forward rather than just reacting to an RFR. Yeah, it's a great question. And I will touch on some elements of, of your question in some subsequent slides. I will say as it relates to national vendors, uh, we, um, uh, we certainly don't foreclose the possibility of a national vendor um, bidding. Um, we have, as part of our ongoing engagement process, as I've talked about, we have been and will continue to be um, engaged with our with our current carriers, but we don't limit ourselves to our current carriers in doing so. We want to be able to evaluate um, other carriers who may present um, different capabilities and different options for us. So uh, we do have our um, our net cast wide uh, for carriers. Um, I will say that we get a good deal of value from our locally based carriers. I don't want to miss the chance to say that they are, uh, ha they have been for many years and continue to be among the top rated um, health plans in the country. Um, and they know our market really well. Um, but that said, um, we certainly wouldn't preclude um, possibilities of, of adding something different through a national carrier. So Matt, I, I think Tamara makes a really good point. I mean, one thing I want to follow up on her question, I know that uh, there's the posting of the RFR. Uh, and so, you know, people who know Massachusetts and know GIC, you know, are very well aware that uh, there's an RFR coming up. But to Tamara's question, is uh, the staff uh, working to reach out to innovative healthcare carriers that might be outside of Massachusetts and let them know that, that we'd be interested in having them bid on this business, that we're looking for innovation. I'm just wondering uh, if, if there is an effort uh, you know, to tomorrow's questions to engage people rather than just uh, you know, the, the passive, but also requirement of procurement law in Massachusetts to post it to yeah. Combi system. Yeah, uh, Valerie, before uh, Matt answers, that's an excellent, thank you, Valerie, for clarifying that. It's exactly what I was talking about. And I always believe in markets. And I, I think that if you, you don't know what you don't know, mm -hmm. and, and if you don't go out and look, uh, you don't know if there's something better out there. And I just think that, uh, you know, we have such a huge member base that uh, any carrier would love to have us as a, uh, as, a, as a customer, but of course they have to be competitive. So I just think that we need to think about um, broadening our market. It doesn't mean we should in any way um, uh, 
eliminate or preclude uh, the current carriers. And yes, they have a vested interest because they're currently with us and also they know Massachusetts and they know us. But Valerie's totally right. Educating them about us, I think is also important. But the service side is critical, of course, in terms of how well they serve our, our, our members. So there, it's, this is complex. It's not simple, which I think uh, we need to start early if that's something that we're going to consider. But uh, thank you, Valerie, for clarifying that for me. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point, Tamara, and I appreciate you bringing it up. And I just wanted to make sure that our commissioners knew that there's a posting process. Again, everything's following you know, mass procurement law. However, there is the opportunity, uh, you know, Matt, this is an exciting time and you know, it's good networking you know, to see what you know, Navidus has to offer or Welldyne or Envision RX, you know, they may be uh, interested in posting, but, you know, uh, responding to the RFR, but they may not know it's coming out. So mm -hmm. it, it's a careful balance and potentially, you know, uh, Jeff might be able to help as well with that, you know, with his, uh, you know, prestigious uh, organization, Willis Towers Watson. Um, you know, again, I know we're not supposed to be, you know, so it's a, a delicate balance. I, I just want to make sure I'm I'm sensitive to the the law and the process, and uh, also thinking if we can be as innovative as possible. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, those comments, uh, Commissioner Davis, Commissioner Sullivan, and um, we hear you, and we will take that back and um, and make sure that we have a robust. Uh, outreach process to make sure that we're not missing some innovative op opportunities. As you note, Valerie, excuse me, Chair Sullivan, um, uh, Willis Towers Watson, I think, can be, can be really helpful here as a nationally known organization, um, really preeminent organization. I will say, if, if it's any reassurance, um, this is a big enough bid that it gets a lot of attention and um, I've already been contacted by a number of our non-traditional carriers to have exploratory conversations. Um, so, uh, but we will, we, we, I hear what you're saying. I agree completely and we will do the best we can to make sure that we trumpet it broadly and get as much uh, interest as we can. That's yeah, great. and as you know, this is Tamar again, and as you know, Matt, there's, there's, there's some real turmoil that's going on in the insurance world. Um, uh, it, you know, not only with mergers, but other activities uh, uh, that are happening in, in, in the insurance world in terms of costs and, and, and premiums and so on. So I, I just think that we could take a possibly advantage of this. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, it'll make our current bidders more competitive, knowing that we are reaching further out. Um, but but I think it's it's also very important for us to determine you know how many providers do we in in, in terms of insurance carriers do we really want to have uh, because after a while it could become very cumbersome and very very complicated for our members to determine which is best and a lot of it sometimes is redundancies and there are only nuances and differences um, and, and I think we need to. Uh, and maybe Towers can help us with this, uh, to really call through and determine, you know, what's the strategic mm -hmm. advantage of mm -hmm. this plan, putting aside price as, as just one of the, uh, of the um, parameters, but what's the advantage of this plan versus this other plan, and do we need both? And, yeah. and so it's, it's really thinking strategically about the, uh, not the process itself, but in terms of how we look at the, our, our carriers. Yep. So actually I have a, a slide further on where I'll say a little bit more about our current thinking there. Good, thank you. See our vice chair has a question. Yeah. Yes, I'm just uh, curious, what's the breakdown now between actives and retirees as far as I, I guess the subscribers um, and the actual you know, membership, which is larger? So I'm curious what the breakdown is uh, now. If, if uh, maybe that's a question for Cameron 
uh, uh, Cameron or maybe Paul about current mm -hmm. enrollment. Um, uh, I off the top of my head, I think we've got uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of one hundred and eighteen thousand active uh, subscribers. Uh, now, that's employees, not members total. Um, and it's somewhere in the ballpark of 100,000 retirees, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. If Paul's and on board, that's... I I'll also note that, uh, as I noted before, there is a, a slide in the appendix of the deck that, that lays out enrollment by carrier. So with some quick math, you, um, you can figure out um, what the breakdown is. Sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. We can certainly follow up. All right, thank you. I assume that that would make some difference with uh, uh, the bidders, right? With bid bidder responses as to what percent of our membership um, are active employees or active members. We, what we would, well. Yeah. They, Carriers will have the opportunity to bid separately on uh, active and Medicare supplement plans. So the non-Medicare retirees are going to be lumped in with the active population. And then, you know, anyone, you know, the in terms of Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage plans, you know, those will be we'll we'll see what we get from uh those the carriers who are interested in bidding on those product lines does that answer your uh question right, but it, well so yeah but it's still one procurement uh, um, yes right i mean it's still one large <laughs> procurement even though they will bid separately right yes um, is that correct but they don't okay. have to bid for for both right they they could bid for active plans, but not retiree plans. Um, mm -hmm. We give them the option um, to do that. Yeah, you know, yeah they're, 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 the, the Medicare and active plans are separately evaluated. Right. As okay. part of, but, but within the same procurement. Right, right, that's what I meant. So it, right, okay. All right, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. That was my recollection from, the last one. I just wanted to clarify that. So thank you. Thanks, Bobby. I see Jeff has something to add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to um, remind, remind or let the commissioners know that, uh, that um, on the medical side in the last procurement, there were bids from two of the nationals, two of the three that were eligible since, uh, since Anthem was probably, was probably not. So, uh, so two, you know, so, so, um, you know, obviously the GIC, as has been said, is a, is a big, important account and, uh, and the national, the, the national plans, as well as some of the more innovative newer plans, they're looking hard for opportunities, you know, opportunities to, uh, you know, op opportunities like this. So I, I, I think that this will be a, uh, you know, I, I think that there will be enormous interest both from, in, you know, incumbents clearly, but also from, uh, you know, all, all, also from other parties and will, you know, that, and as uh, folks have said, that helps, uh, that helps keep, you know, keep the incumbents working harder and uh, it gives the GIC more good choices. Um, you know, all, all, also, of course, uh, it, of course, it, you know, it does, it does, it does mean the potential for more changes for members too. But I think it's an important point, and there, and there will definitely be uh, be uh, interest from parties that don't have a current contract with the GIC, and we'll encourage that. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. It's a good conversation. Let's uh, keep moving. All right, um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. We've shared uh, this timeline with you before, um, high level timelines relative to the procurement. We, we have added a few dates in here. Uh, they're a little more specific um, from last slides or previous presentations. Um, and as you can see, we've um, kind of broken them out by the phases in the process that were referenced in the prior slide. Just leave that there for a moment if folks have any questions about our timeline, but this is pretty consistent with what we've been uh, talking with you uh, for some time. 
And do you think there'll be any impact to open enrollment and getting that work done while you're also doing some of this heavy lifting? Um, we will do our best to balance all of our competing priorities in a very busy time. And I think we're, I'm very fortunate. We are all very fortunate to have um, uh, Paul Murphy and Donna Wartman heading up our operations unit um, that, does uh, a significant amount of amount of the heavy lifting here and they've done it for many many years and they did it during covid <laughs> among other things um, I'm also uh, really encouraged um, not to give too many shout outs to our new staff Leslie Montero here but um, communications is a really important part of our successful and effective preparation for annual enrollment. Um, so having her on board with her skill set will be really important. And she's already hit the ground running, making herself a, an important part of the prep team for annual enrollment. So I'm confident that we'll be that we'll be fine. I, I would say, you know, the wrinkle this year that will require some substantial additional work is the departure of Fallon at the end of this year. So those members who are enrolled in Fallon plans will need to find another plan. And, and we are working on a, um, on a game plan to make sure that that happens efficiently and smoothly. Thanks, Matt. Is Health New England able to service our constituents in Worcester? And, and so it is, are we doing any work to figure out how to help our constituents who are you know, based in that central mass area in prep for you know, no Fallon? I would say generally that our evaluation of um, our, the development of the plan here will we'll have to consider the coverage areas of our existing plans so that we can make sure that you know, they have options that that meet their needs um so without saying anything about specific carriers we will that will be part of our work okay all right and then potentially they're already doing some work on their own knowing this is happening and our constituents will be well served and have minimal disruption we have um heard significant interest from our current vendors in filling the void good Thank you. All right, let's 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 keep moving. Okay, so there's really two more slides here, but a lot to them that I wanna to speak to. Um, if we can go to the next slide. I think we have a question from Commissioner Kleinard. Oh, sorry. Before we can go to the next slide. Oh, thank you. My question, and this is, you were just talking about communication. The last procurement, as those of us that were on the commission remember, a lot of the constituents were, were, were uncomfortable with the amount of change that was proposed. And I'm just curious, and all of your reach out, are the members understanding we're coming to that point again, where there may be a, a lot of change? And I understand it's a lot of disruption, and I don't want to minimize it, but um, do you feel like everyone is better prepared for what may or may not be proposed? I, we can never do enough in that space. Let me start there. Um, and I think one of the real benefits of our engagement strategy, um, particularly with labor, um, is loudly, not loudly, but very consistently saying that we are at the beginning of this process and letting folks know what the timeline is. Um, I, um, I would say that um, there's a pretty profound understanding of the scale of change that could be possible through the procurement based on the last procurement. And I'm sure a higher level of sensitivity and awareness, therefore, as part of this year's um, effort. Um, I will say that, you know, and I can't offer specifics on this just yet, but 
we do want to um, try to find more opportunities beyond those um, engagement type meetings to uh, more broadly inform our members, of not only that the procurement is coming, but how we are thinking about the procurement. Um, of course, we'll have to do that before the RFR is issued, but I think there's a, there's, there's, there's a communication strategy that we are contemplating and that we'll have to build out over the coming months to, um, to do as much as we can there. Um, I hope that's helpful. It is definitely on my mind. I, as we have said in many of our meetings, we don't want anybody to be caught off guard that this process is happening um, without, you know, having a, because we are in the process now and we don't have firm uh, strategic options to start to communicate, I think it will be, um, you know, it, it may be much to assume that they understand how broad the scope of change could be, um, but we will have to uh, balance that over the coming months. Sorry, that's a lot of talking, but it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely on our mind and we're looking for all kinds of opportunities to do that better. No, it's a good question, Christy. And, you know, for our members of the commission who represent labor and constituents, I'm confident they're hearing loud and clear that their, uh, their position uh, will, will uh, you know, help them drive towards uh, broader communication uh, to the folks that have, uh, you know, looked to them to represent them. And here's Bobby to- yeah, but Before Bobby speaks, let me just say one other thing, which is that, you know, I think the survey uh, that we conducted, which went out uh, to a substantial portion of our membership, I mean, that also makes it very clear that we're beginning this process and trying to obtain their feedback about what they would like. So um, that I think was helpful as well. Go ahead, Bobby. Yeah, and I, love, I, I think the survey is great. It gives you good data, so it's really good. I think the survey is great, but I think uh, the listening sessions, particularly that we had last year, because they were all so well attended, and I think they are, in many respects, more effective than a survey because there's only you know twenty percent, maybe um, if that of, of uh, the subscribers, right, um, respond to surveys. Whereas we had terrific attendance at the virtual listening sessions. And I don't know, Matt, if I know it's on the calendar, but I don't know if you've already decided sort of how many listening sessions uh, there will be, but um, but that's a really good forum for communicating to the members that, you know, the procurement is coming up and, or that Fallon, it, you know, will not be participating next year. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a great forum for um, people to ask questions. That was terrific last year during COVID. And now we'll have the procurement to add to mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's a really good point, um, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, thank you for the compliments around the listening sessions. We intend to have very robust listening sessions again this year. Um, what especially, so we typically use the listening sessions in the past as an opportunity to inform our members about changes to benefits and potential changes to rates for the coming fiscal year. Um, while I think that is important, I think um, I think this year we do have the opportunity to use those listening sessions for a broader purpose. Um, I think our our challenge will be to um, to um, be in a place to be able to say enough, specifically about our strategy by the time the listening sessions happen, because we do still need to do them in advance of our plan design changes 
um, in February. Um, so, uh, but I, but that is very much on my mind, having the opportunity to talk about our strategy directly to our members through forums like that. That's great. Thank uh, you. Anna has her hand up. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to add to this, to this question about informing and, and sort of including members in the discussion about the, you know, potential upcoming changes. And I completely understand how challenging this is given timing. Um, and I, I think that that survey was, was great. It started to really um, elicit how members might trade things off or, or uh, make choices should they be presented. Um, the thing I was just gonna add to the conversation is that people often, you know, when they're doing a, a conjoint survey and it's all in the future and it's all sort of hypothetical are able to make trade-offs that are harder for themselves than when it's in the, when it's in the present. And you're actually saying, no, today you have to give up this in order to get this in the future. It's, it's even though it's the same people, <laughs> and you're, yeah. it's, you know, it's so, so I do think, um, anticipating that and sort of building that into the, the plan is, is going to be important. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, you may proceed. I don't see any other questions. Okay, um, so here, um, what we want to do is to try to bring together some key elements of our strategy thinking to date. And I think much of this will look familiar, especially in the strategic focus areas uh, listed on the left. But here, what we wanted to convey is how the procurement strategy team, um, working with our colleagues at Willis, is translating our um, strategic areas of focus into both strategic objectives and then therefore into guiding principles for uh, the procurement. Um, so here I want to emphasize mostly the middle part of the graphic. Um, happy to have you review the guiding principles, which I suspect will be um, uh, will resonate well with the commission. Um, but this central graphic here around the strategic objective, I think it's important to note that we don't see the strategic areas of focus of affordability, health equity, and behavioral health as unrelated sort of silos of strategy, but instead are very much interconnected. Um, so addressing the rising pressures on affordability, the rising cost drivers that we've talked about over the course of the year, is not the central focus of our strategy as an objective unto itself, but we focus on affordability because a failure to do so has a number of really important implications for us. I wanted to talk a little bit about those to tell you how we're viewing this as one combined strategic objective. So failure to really address cost drivers hinders us from providing the kind of affordability and the quality that our, that our members want, that they've expressed to us, but it also keeps them from spending um, income on other things that are important to them. Uh, and this I think is really especially important for our members on the lower end of the wage scale. So I think it resonates with our focus on health equity. Um, it inhibits our ability at the GIC to make progress on important goals related to behavioral health and primary care um, in addition to health equity. And it keeps the GIC from addressing problems that are inherent today in the broader healthcare system. So when we overpay highly consolidated hospitals for care that they deliver incidentally to typically wealthier patients, we pay less to community hospitals. We pay less to community health centers that care for patients in lower income communities. So there is a profound fairness and equity element to our affordability strategy. Um, I will note here that um, the attorney general's office has done some really 
uh, thoughtful work on this in a 2018 report. And for those who um, had the opportunity to, or will have the opportunity to listen into the cost trends hearings yesterday, that was a, a very loud theme, strong theme that came through that affordability, we need to address affordability for affordability's sake, but there are other really important uh, impacts here that we need to evaluate. Um, it means, you know, we risk the losing lower cost provider systems as they get squeezed out. Um, again, a lot of discussion on that yesterday at the Health Policy Commission. So the GIC is not going to be able to solve that um, on our own, um, but we do have a stake in successfully um, strengthening a value-based delivery system. Um, and I would say finally that um, failure to address cost drivers increases the financial burden on taxpayers and on the state budget. We need to be very mindful of that. It's you know the lion's share, the, the large share of premium is paid by the state budget. So that inhibits taxpayers from spending um, those funds on things that they need, um, especially in these challenging times. But it also makes it more of a challenge for the governor and the legislature to invest in important other priority needs for the Commonwealth, um, education, transportation, other priorities. But I would say more broadly, again, coming back to the equity frame here, we talk a lot about social determinants of health and how important it is from an equity perspective to address them. There will be some modest opportunities for us at the GIC to address those, um, but the Commonwealth through its budget priorities has the opportunity to address those working with us. So to the degree that our burden on the budget increases, um, we, it, we have, um, it, it impedes their ability to make progress on those priorities. So the, the frame I wanna leave here with you is that rising healthcare costs um, that increase premiums present massive opportunity costs for us, for the Commonwealth, for our members. Um, and that is why uh, we need to address them in a real meaningful way. So I wanna stop there. Um, have you uh, respond to that, provide feedback to that, address any of our guiding principles here. If there's anything that you think that we're missing, um, we, would love to, we would love to hear that and incorporate it. Yeah, Eileen has a comment or question. And, and before we move on, let me just say that the next slide will have a little bit more kind of specific detail about how we're thinking about our product portfolio and different strategies. But this, I wanted to give that important frame. Yeah, go ahead, Eileen, and then Toby. Sure. Um, so thank you, Matt. I really appreciated your comments about how they're interconnected, affordability, health equity, behavioral health, um, and, and would underscore that. But I will say, as a small entity that purchases in the small group market, um, the, these pressures are even more pronounced. And, and, and so, um, you know, at the cost trend, when they talked about now the cost of a family health insurance plan um, equaling the cost of an you know, um, economic car purchase every year, right? I mean, I think it just drives home the amount of money that we're spending. And I will say that with each year, um, certainly, we get less insurance, right? So, um, you know, between co-insurance and the deductibles and, and, and so forth, um, I, I think we really are at a pivotal point. And, and the other thing I would add is, you know, the pandemic changed a lot of things about the way people live and work. And one of them is just the increased mobility. And so to the extent that Massachusetts is an outlier, with some of these big costs, I worry that we could drive people out of the economy and out of Massachusetts, which would have profound repercussions, certainly on the ability to grow on the budget and a whole host of other things. So I, I, I do think trying to 
um, align our health care cost more in the middle with other states um, is critically important for a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that, Eileen. Um, and I watched that um, panel yesterday with a great deal of interest. And uh, one of the commissioners noted that um, it amounts to a um, a confiscation of resources uh, by the healthcare system, which I thought was really, um, it's a strong word to use, but uh, it resonated with me. Um, and it's not just, as you're noting, it's not just um, those uh, interests that I mentioned, but certainly others, uh, everybody who purchases insurance. Commissioner Cho. I don't disagree with you know anything that people have said, and those are certainly noble thoughts. What I'm really I'm trying to understand how we are going to take these strategic objectives with the guiding principles and drive them down into something that you can make a decision on. I'm not saying right now today because um, you're not there yet. For example, ease burden on taxpayers. Are we going to set a percentage increase we're going for or something like that? I'm not sure I know what value-based system is, but it sounds good. Um, and, and we want to put aside, do we want to put aside some money on something on the behavioral health or the equity of the primary care? Do we want to do something there? I mean, do we want to say we want to have put, you know, I'm just making the numbers up. We want to put $10 million towards something. You know what I'm saying? How do we, mm -hmm. how do we make this real? Right. And, and yeah. I, within that context, creating trade-offs and discussion, you know, I understand that. Yeah, as you noted, that is the work that's ahead. And I think, as I said, the, the, the trick will be for us is saying as much as we can about how we're approaching this as we go through the process without sharing things with, that you, with, with you all that are not fully baked, but we will have a little bit more to say about those topics uh, in the next slide. Yeah, I mean, some of those, yes. I, okay, that's, that, I just, maybe I just get that up. No, yeah, I, 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 but, we can really discuss it. That's all. Yeah, I, we're, you all and I are going to want to have deeper discussions on the specifics of our strategy today than we really have the opportunity to do. And um, I, this is the the first of at least two, if not more, um, uh, discussions on this topic as we get further down the line. But we, I, I will note that we have, we have specific working groups, internal and with Willis Towers Watson, that are drilling down on potential strategies in, in, in a great deal of detail. We are working with our colleagues in other states to understand what they're doing. Um, we are watching very closely the work in the legislature and uh, by our other sister state agencies um, and through our engagement process, of course, learning uh, as much as we can about uh, what's happening in the marketplace that we can leverage because we're, you know, we don't want to be creating strategies out of whole cloth and foisting them on the system. I think that produces, you know, substantial risks. So we want to look for strategies that are, have a reasonable likelihood of success, right? So, um, that work is, is ongoing and has been ongoing for the last several months since the kind of late spring. So we've got a lot more here than we can talk about today, but we will talk about it in more detail as we go through the process. Uh, Bobby has her hand up. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to make a comment regarding the burden on taxpayers. I think people forget that all you know, 218,000 subscribers, uh, active employees and retirees are taxpayers as well, mm -hmm. okay? That we are not given this. We pay taxes in addition to receiving benefits for receiving compensation that is less than the private sector. So I wanna remind people and I'm sure all my labor colleagues will agree um, that 
that we are also taxpayers. And the very reason that we receive, you know, such great health insurance, okay, is part of the deal, if you will, for receiving less compensation than the private sector. We all know that the economy here is booming. And there was a 7% increase in population in Massachusetts. I'm not worried that people are gonna be, you know, leaving here in droves. We have in general, very high pay for in many sectors, particularly the, you know, healthcare industry um, and biotech. Um, and yes, there is a great deal of disparity that we need to, um, and a lack of equity in healthcare that we need to address. But we are also, um, we don't have the luxury of contracting with the providers directly. We don't have any input in that. Our contracts are with the insurance carriers who then you know, contract with providers. And we do not have the luxury of sort of being involved. We're restricted. So we don't have as much um, flexibility uh, because there are procurement uh, laws and regulations as well as statutory obligations. So I want to just remind people as we're going into, you know, thinking about an FY24 procurement that, that it's very important to keep these in mind. We're not being given as, state, as a state employee for more than 30 years. I don't feel that I'm, you know, I'm a taxpayer too. And I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. Very well said, all. Madam sorry, Vice Chair. Sorry no, for getting very well a said. little emotional about that. Yeah, thank no, you, Bobby, thank you for sharing that. Uh, we do appreciate the work that every constituent does in this state and the retirees. And, you know, there's always a balance. And so, you know, as, as, uh, as you know, uh, that is uh, definitely uh, one of our jobs as commissioners and as this board to balance all of the needs and to make sure we're not over indexing on, on one need versus another. Um, and, and so let's hear from Eileen. Uh, I think she had her hand up. I do, yeah. I, I just, um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I just wanted to clarify, my point was a macro one that affordability um, of healthcare, you know, when we have among the highest costs, certainly in the country, some would say in the world, does have impacts and, and um, I just, I, I think that we um, want to be aware of them and, and with the purchasing power of the group insurance, you know, want to be a leader in trying to develop strategies to help contain those costs. And, um, you know, and I know that Massachusetts did grow according to the census, but that was pre-pandemic. And I just, I do think that we have to be mindful of the increased mobility. That, that was just, that was my point. It, it wasn't a, a stab, Bobby, at, at um, state workers or anything. It was about the more macro impacts of, of higher healthcare costs. Good discussion. Uh, everybody's viewpoint is appreciated and uh, you know, that's what makes this a great commission. So, you know, appreciate all the back and forth and, uh, you know, thank you, Matt, for, uh, you know, for those who are on the YouTube and our, our taxpayers, uh, you know, that, that they're, they're represented, but clearly our constituents and making sure they get the care they need uh, and the outcomes we need from what we pay, uh, you know, I think is stated on this slide nicely as a goal. So, Let's move on, Matt. I could just say one other thing about a comment that Bobby made. Um, you know, she described accurately the current state of affairs as it relates to provider prices and our reliance on carriers. Um, 
but that is also an area that is the current state, but it doesn't have to be the future state and can be an area where we can evaluate options as well. So speaking of options, um, so this is the last slide in this and uh, this portion of the, uh, of the presentation. So here I wanted to try to capture a few of the categories um, of some of our thinking to date. Uh, my commitment throughout this process will be to convey as much to you as I can, as I said. Um, and communications, I think here, as we've talked about already, will be key to our success and will be important to finding um, the right balance here of sharing information with you and with others. Um, at this stage, what we're sharing is fairly high level. As we get further along, we'll continue to share more. Um, so um, first and most importantly here in the top row, um, we are evaluating what the suite of products we offer to our members looks like, how many, what type, what features, which carriers. Um, we have uh, survey results um, that strongly suggest that our members are largely satisfied with their current offerings and are very sensitive to plan design changes, which are understandable. Um, our thinking to this point is to try to preserve what is most highly valued among our members and make some modest adjustments to those plans. Um, but that said, with the exit of two of our incumbent plans, again, decisions that they've made uh, either to leave or to merge, we do have room um, on our product shelf now that we can use to provide um, meaningful new options for them. As we've often talked about, and as Commissioner Davis noted, we wanna be able to provide differentiated options, not simply a set of uh, options with a, with a different logo, all of which look quite similar. Um, so we wanna, I think we see the opportunity there with the, um, with the narrowing of the number of incumbents um, to add some of those new options. I, I will say here that um, I candidly don't see aggressive consolidation of carriers as a strategy that ultimately will alter the dysfunctions of the healthcare marketplace and give the GIC through our carriers greater value, um, greater leverage to get better contracts with providers. It would certainly simplify our administrative functions, could provide a more streamlined experience for our members, but we know that our members value choice. And um, so I would say this generally is the direction that I would describe us um, heading in. So you may ask if, if consolidation isn't the centerpiece of our strategy to address affordability, uh, what is? And what I would say at this point is that, you know, we are exploring those areas um, in, in a great deal of detail. Uh, we'll be talking with you about them more in the coming months. Um, and as I said, working with our colleagues in state government and, um, and learning what's happening in the marketplace from public payers and private payers. So Mass Health is doing some interesting work. Medicare uh, uh, through their shared savings program being adopted in the marketplace um, and producing some really interesting different changes in care delivery. Uh, providers and carriers are looking to work together in new and different ways to provide value to members. Um, so we want to understand how far along those efforts are, what are new ideas that we've not contemplated. So um, we are, that is the work that is happening uh, internally at the GIC now, and, and which when we get further along, we want to present to you. Um, I think here we also want to be very mindful that, you know, the work in the legislature that I described earlier um, could evolve in ways that impacts what we can do and how we can do it um, through the procurement and the timing makes that a bit of a challenge. So 
all the more important for us to stay in touch with our colleagues um, in the legislature. Um, Second here, we also see the need, as we've often talked about, to support our members um, as they make choices and enrolling in coverage. That means decision support tools and a robust effort to help them become smart shoppers of health insurance. Um, that is no small task. We are evaluating um, potential vendor options to do that, potential ways to evolve our member portal with new and different features to assist them in doing that. Um, so that, you know, if we're gonna provide opportunities for differentiated choice, then we need to provide the support for our members so that they can make good decisions there. And then thirdly, I'd say here, um, as you know, before I took this job, um, the GIC has been evaluating and talking about centers of excellence. We've had some interesting work with each of our carriers doing their own centers of excellence. Um, there may be some opportunities for us over time um, to uh, work with a specialty vendor to assist our members for specific categories of service, whether it's surgical episodes or some other type of episodes of care. This way we can, um, we can drive our members towards areas where high quality care is being delivered and give us the opportunity to um, make sure that those are being delivered, um, meeting the objectives of affordability. So um, I'm gonna stop there. Um, as I've said, behind this slide is a tremendous amount of ongoing work. And um, I wanted at least to sort of share as much as we could at this point, and that's what we've attempted to do here. So I'm sure this will provoke some, um, some, some thinking and some conversation and some questions, which I'm happy to, happy to field. Yeah, I don't see any questions. I think we've been peppering you with questions all through this presentation. And if, if I could, uh, you know, just say, uh, we definitely know there's a lot of work going on. Uh, we are appreciative of the degree of detail you'll put into, you know, thinking about the strategy and, you know, getting input from, from all of the stakeholders. And, you know, we've heard loud and clear that, uh, you know, changes are, are contemplated and may happen. And we're mindful of, you know, that careful balance to, you know, provide the best care at the lowest cost to support as you're seeing the health care equity. And we, I think we all appreciate that you're um, focused in this area uh, on a consistent basis. It's important for, you know, for our society. So thank you. And then, you know, you know, I love uh, the focus on behavioral health, uh, the importance of that to overall health. So I, I know we are seeing uh, consistency in what you're focused on. We know there's a lot of work. Uh, we will await uh, the next step in this process and appreciate your keeping us engaged all through it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I don't see any questions. I think we've peppered you all throughout these hmm. presentations. You've left us You've left us with what we need to, uh, to be informed. All right. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I, I, that really concludes the substance of our presentation to the commission today. Um, we look forward to our December meeting um, and uh, look forward to beginning that process of rate development for next year. Um, and look, we're, we're open for feedback on how to do this process differently. Um, this, is, um, this is why I came here to the GIC was to take as the best advantage of this opportunity that we possibly can uh, these don't roll around very often, once every five years, as it turns out here. Um, we have to 
you know, our obligation, I think, is to look over the horizon as it relates to the procurement. Um, this is, as was expressed a, a great deal yesterday at the HPC, a unique moment. And COVID has, in some respects, really severely impacted the healthcare delivery system. And we need to be mindful of that. At the same time, um, we need to look um, over the horizon to um, address these issues. So that's what we intend to do. I see my vice chair has a question. Yeah, well, it's just a comment, really. I just wanted to thank you and um, you know everyone at the at uh, the GIC for all the hard work uh, that you've done so far, and and for all the hard work that is yet to come in the next you know year, year and a half. It's it's. Um, it really is. We're really sort of at a precipice with with um, with COVID having made such a huge difference. But I wanted to thank you also on behalf of my labor colleagues that that um, um, I'm very glad you're at the helm of this agency and appreciate very much um, the work that uh, you were doing. Thank you, Bobby. I want kind to of you. That. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Yeah. So at this point, I, I want to conclude our meeting. I do want to thank all the commissioners who asked questions. So, uh, you know, like the engagement, even though I'm missing you all in person. And I want to wish you an absolute wonderful Thanksgiving and hope that you stay safe, that you enjoy family and friends that you, uh, you know, take some time to, to have the self-care that will help us uh, be as effective uh, for Matt uh, as, as an advisor to him and the commission uh, in the coming months. So thanks everybody, uh, happy Thursday and see you next month. It's good. Thank have you. Have a nice happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, happy Thanksgiving. Yes, you too, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Matt. Bye-bye.